ladies and gentlemen, returning to the Ray Carr Show is everybody's favorite author and historian, Peter Chexfield. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ray. Good to be back. Thank you. How many books are you up to now? I've written uh, 14. <laughs> 12 of them on music, and I did a couple during lockdown of my photography, which I used to do years ago. But, but yeah, 14 books. Yeah. And that's in five years, so it's, it's quite a workload. Yeah, it certainly is. I've got about seven of them, but uh, they're all they're all remarkable and they're incredible uh, tools for reference. Because uh, without some of your books, I wouldn't be able to find out certain information that I need for my show. And uh, and I'm very fortunate that you've published these. Where did you get your background in writing? Oh, I don't know really. Uh, I, 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 I certainly wasn't through education. I mean. Uh, a uh, cut long story short, me and my parents separated at a young age, and I was backwards and forwards. And I, I went to uh, eight, uh, sorry, I, I went to four secondary schools. Yeah, you know, within the last five years of my school life, I went to four schools, and that was very disruptive. And I left with no uh, no qualifications. But uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just reading and uh, just occasionally uh, writing into I don't know record collector or fan club uh, magazines, and it, it just developed from there. And uh, yeah. Um, somebody wrote in after we interviewed last time about what is your day job? That is my day job, more or less now. I've done loads of jobs over the years, and I, I took I, I was lucky enough to take early retirement in in uh, well, about two years ago now. But I, I've done loads of jobs. Um, my most recent job for a few years, I was actually a doorman at a local theatre, uh, which unfortunately closed recently after 100 years, but uh, it's called uh, Margate Winter Gardens. But uh, I mean, the Beatles played there you know, before mm -hmm. my time. But, but I, I'd meet quite a few uh, performers you know, uh, over the years and uh, you know, get to know. And that was a great experience. Yeah, I mean, it I didn't make much money out of it, but a great experience. Sometimes the, the great experiences in life are the ones you don't make any money on, and those are the ones that stay with you the longest. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, the book we're going to speak about today is Jerry Lee Lewis, Breathless, Every Song from Every Session, 1952 to 2002. And boy, have there ever been a lot of sessions. And, 2022, you know, just correct you there. Yeah, 2022. It's amazing of all the different phases, um, I like to say, of, of Jerry's career, um, you know, from going to rock and roll to kind of falling into obscurity, then going into country, which a lot of mainstream people forget about. Um, and trying to, you know, put his way back on the charts in the 1982, um, he put out an album with MCA, I recall, and it was with some old standards. So, you know, talk a little bit about, in your opinion, um, your perspective of Jerry's career and where it came from and uh, where it ended up. Yeah, uh, well, as you know, no, he uh, started at Sun Records, you know, the, uh, you know, well, about a year after Elvis, or uh, two years after Elvis, you know, shortly after Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash made success, he was the last big star for Sun, really. And uh, yeah, and and you know, had big hits, a whole lot of shaking going on. Great Balls of Fire, Breathless, High School Confidential. Then he then his career crashed because of a notorious uh, marriage. Well, I won't go too much detail here, but uh, but but then uh, he. Uh, to me, his most uh, interesting musical period, really. I mean, as you said, he, he had a country comeback, and that was from 68 onwards. But from about 1960 to 67, I mean, all these producers and all these uh, people around him and Jerry himself, they were trying so many different styles. And and that, that just fascinates me. He just made so many fantastic records. I, I mean, he had the country comeback in 1968, but the year before that, he uh, cut an album called Soul My Way. Which uh, which is soul, basically his way. A very very different, but very different direction. So yeah. What do you think made him do that? I mean, uh, you know, some artists kind of stay within what they feel comfortable in, and other artists are uh, far more willing to try different things that they probably know might not work. But you know, Jerry was a was a different cat. How would you describe him after you met him? Uh, <laughs> well, well, first first of all, uh, your your first question really. Uh, I think a lot of that was the it was the producers, uh, you know, various producers pushing him in various directions. But uh, I mean, J Jerry Lee Lewis himself, you know, he'd claim that that no one influenced him, especially you know once he be became successful. But that's not strictly true. In uh, in 1961, I believe, he went on tour in the USA with Jackie Wilson, 
and uh, in it, and he also became more and more uh, friendly and more of a fan of Ray Charles. And you listen to a lot of his sixties recordings. There's that black, soulful sort of bluesy edge that he didn't have before or later. So he he was uh, influenced by other people, and and so my way was a culmination really of a. Uh, you know, of, the, of the Ray Charles and Jackie Wilson uh, kind of influence. And, uh, yeah, I, I met him several times and uh, he was it was different every time. He, he, he could change, really, you know, within 10 minutes. And uh, uh, the, the concerts I, I, I saw, uh, by the time I started to see him in the 80s, he'd only do one show a night. But I've got audio tapes of him throughout the 70s. And the first show would be so much different from the second show, not just musically, but the mood he was in. You know, <laughs> I think that perhaps he, uh, people have speculated he, he suffered from uh, undiagnosed bipolar. and uh, Yeah, exacerbated uh, by alcohol. Yeah, yeah, alcohol and later drugs. Uh, I mean, he was pretty much an alcoholic throughout the 70s and... But then in 1981, he, uh, I don't know if you remember, he was hospitalised for about three months and his, his stomach split open. And he couldn't really drink much after that, but he got more and more into the pills throughout the 80s into the 90s instead. So, so yeah, a mixture of the two, yeah. Yeah, he had a very addictive personality. He was very mercurial, I guess that would be a good word to use. Uh, you know, yeah. some of the unpredictable changes of mood and mind, and that uh, was a perfect example of, of his strange, um, you know, odd behaviour. But he did give us a lot of stuff, and you mentioned a lot of the soul influences. Some of the records that were written by black artists, Otis Blackwell, um, he wrote um, Great Balls of Fire, Breathless. He also wrote Don't Be Cruel and All Shook Up for Elvis. Uh, and uh, he was, a, you know, I mean, he recorded those songs, and those were some of his biggest hits. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, people have uh, uh, spoken before, you know, uh, Mentioned perhaps uh, during, the, as you know, I like a lot of the sixties beat groups and the sixties rhythm and blues groups. And people have uh, said, you know, you know, Jerry Lewis didn't influence um, uh, people as much as say Chuck Berry or Buddy Holly or Little Richard. And I think that was a big thing. Jerry Lewis, a bit like Elvis, was an interpreter. He, he wrote a few songs here and there, most of them, you know, nothing special. But he interpreted you know, other songwriters, and and that that was his strength. You know, a bit like Elvis and Frank Sinatra, even. You know. He, you don't have to be a, you know, a great, great songwriter to be a great artist. Right, right. Um, did you, in your opinion, um, you've studied this uh, longer than most people. Do you feel, do you feel that his um, musicianship was top of the line? Do you think he was one of the best at what he did? Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, in a in a very sort of uh, uneducated. Uh, I, I don't mean that, uh, you know, that badly, but. Uh, you know, a, a sort of untutored way. Yeah, you know, it was it was a lot of it by instinct. But uh, I mean, I've heard, I've heard session tapes. You know, some of some of these uh, songs he did at Sun. You know, Ice Cold Confidential and uh, Breathless and, uh, and a, a few a few more obscure things. And there'd be eight tapes and ten t or ten tapes, and they'd be completely different. And but, but it wasn't planned. It wasn't it wasn't like they'd all sit around. Right, let's have a different solo there. Let's have a different introduction. It would all be you know just spontaneous. And and that's the way uh, I remember him best in concerts, uh, especially when I he was still at his peak, I'd say, in in the, in the eighties, you know, when I first started seeing him. And although it, it continued, it, it, sometimes you know, it, the front of the next night's show, there'd be a, a several with the same same numbers. I'd have tapes of them; they'd be completely different. They'd have completely different lyrics. They'd be in a different key. They'd be at a different tempo. They'd have different stops and starts. It was a <laughs> It must have been a nightmare, but uh, but fascinating in a way, being one of his backing musicians. Yeah, you know, he just had that way of, um, he had an extemporaneous talent to him that can't be uh, taught. Yeah. He really did. Um, what songs do you think defined him other than uh, Great Balls of Fire, Breathless, and the uh, whole lot of shaking going on? Other than those three, what songs do you think of, throughout his career and that you've researched that you feel really embody the greatness of what he was? Uh, I'd say Mean Woman Blues. Uh, in America, it was on an EP, but but in uh, the UK, it's, it's one of his best known uh, songs because in the UK, he only had one number one, and that was Great Balls of Fire. In America, the flip side was Hank Williams, You Win Again. But in the UK, it was Mean Woman Blues. But basically, he'd, uh, he'd heard uh, 
before it was even released, he'd heard Hel Elvis Presley's version of Mean Woman Blues, but he'd only remembered the, the uh, chorus and made up, you know, wrote his own lyrics. Huh. But, the, but but also, but there's, there's, you know, there's piano solo after piano solo over that, and it, and it is incredible. And uh, I've, I've, I've met a lot of talented piano players who can pretty much copy everything Jerry Lee Lewis did and Fats Domino's did and Ray Charles did, but even they say, you know, there's parts of Mean Woman Blues that they, they just can't work out how he did it. And it, and he was 22 years old at the time, and he did it in one take. <laughs> <laughs> that's, wow. that's the amazing thing, yeah. <laughs> wow, you're right. That is yeah. that is that is quite amazing. That's yeah. Some people just have the natural ability. They don't have to study music. They can feel music. It's like a, it's in their soul, and it just exactly comes that. up. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we, we talked about Soul My Way, um, the 1967 album here, but we let me talk about a few of the tracks that I, I failed to mention. Um, he did, um, I just dropped in, uh, Treat Her Right. I mean, you wouldn't think that he would record those songs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's songs that it's like, wow, did he really record that? I mean, amazing, really. Yeah, and, uh, and Just Dropped In was a... Uh... You know, he was one of the first people uh, to record it. It was Kenny Rogers and the new edition later took the song and made it a big hit. But, but Jerry Lewis uh, took it, but recorded it before Kenny Rogers. And it was the same with Green Green Grass of Home and uh, and Detroit City on, a, on an earlier album. Tom Jones, who was a, who's always been a big Jerry Lewis fan and all, always uh, acknowledged that, uh, took the album it was on called Country Songs for City Folks recorded those two songs and had big hits of it, especially Green Green Grass of Home, uh, still one of Tom Jones' signature songs. But Jerry Lewis did it first. Yeah, I mean, wow. I mean, just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. You know, Kenny Rogers at 1968-69, uh, and but Jerry Lee doing it first. Very few people know that. Yeah, and uh, and it's just strange, because you know, Jer Jerry Lee Lewis attended... Uh, you know, unlike, say, the you know, I'm not putting down the Beatles or the Stones or Pink Floyd or whatever, to Jer Jerry Lewis, the, the, he had to sort of have lived the lyrics or to identify with the lyrics. So it was very, it's very strange, even now, hearing Jerry Lee Lewis singing, I just dropped in to see what my condition was in, you know, <laughs> or whatever it, it goes. It's just, uh, it's very strange. And and you can hear in his voice, he's, he, he's although it's a good version, I think part of him is thinking, you know, what is this I'm, I'm singing? You know, what is it? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to actually play that before we run this interview uh, on the air. So it'll be kind of cool. Peter, you know, when, when you're sitting around your office, I could see it uh, on Zoom here. Uh, mm -hmm. You have just quite a voluminous library of artifacts, music, um, books, things of that nature. Do you just sit in your office sometimes and go, boy, you know, does something catch your eye and go, I want to write about that or that just... I didn't realize that. I'm going to look more into that. Is is that how you come up with ideas? Yeah, uh, sometimes the uh, my, my best books really they're just a uh, sudden inspiration. Well, I'll tell you why I, I did the Jerry Lee Lewis book, and and it only took me two months, two months from idea to publication. And but I was working from a uh, from what six six a.m. to ten p.m. most days. I, I really really went through it. But the, but the reason was well, two reasons. A he died, and B, I reached my 60th birthday. And the combination of those, I started looking back, looking at old photos and listening to tapes, and I thought, you yeah, I need to write about this. I never, ever had any plans to write about Jerry Lee Lewis, but suddenly, you know, just looking back and looking at old photos, you know, I think, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, but I, I need to do it quick. I need to do it, you know, why, why, why it's hot, why it's all in my mind, and, and that's how I did that one. So. Yeah, I'm going to, um, well, you and I are the same age, and um, I actually yeah. found a, a, a picture sleeve of Great Balls of Fire. Somebody had given me 30 years ago, you know, and I still have the, for the 45 sleeve. Mm -hmm. And it, I look at it, boy, you know, if you look at the cover of it, he's he's speaking to a young girl. It's like, wow, you know, the, the foreshadowing of what was to, about to happen. <laughs> yeah. Huh? yeah. Tell me a little story about one of the most interesting things about Jerry that most people might not know. Uh, that's a difficult one. It, it, it's, there's there's so, so many stories, aren't there? Uh, well, 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 something was never uh, really uh, uh, publicised, and and his sister, I, I know his sister Linda Gale Lewis quite well, and uh, she's told me this, and so has his daughter Phoebe and a few of his other musicians. He was uh, quite involved, uh, just like his friend Carl Perkins, in a children's charity. 
But Carl Perkins tended to talk about it a bit. You know, I'm not putting down Carl Perkins. I love Carl Perkins. But Jerry Lewis, it, it, he, he never acknowledged you know, that, that he'd, he'd do these charity gigs and never get paid for them. You know, or, or, or he'd donate fees from, from gigs to, to certain charities that meant a lot to him, which are... Uh, which, which I find incredible. You know, people think of him, you know, as the as the mean killer, you know, sort of thing. You know, this uh, yeah. this, this wild man. But uh, I think there was, a, you know, a, a gentle, you know, caring side. I, I think there really was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's got to be some of that inside of him, and I think, uh, you know, as we talked about before, there may have been some other psychological issues or perhaps uh, added uh, added problems by substance abuse. But through that, he was a pioneer. He was a man that survived and he went through yeah. quite a bit of uh, transformation and the book jerry lee lewis breathless every song from every session 1952 to 2022 peter checksfield our special guest i would recommend it any one of peter's books and i i'm saying this honestly are an invaluable tool of research knowledge and enjoyment so peter everything that you touch seems to kind of turn into gold thank you yeah uh not not always financial gold, gold unfortunately, but uh... <laughs> well, it, you know, sometimes it takes time. But you know, even the most appreciated and loved um, art, books, music, course, don't yeah. always get appreciated or rewarded right away, as you know. Of course, yeah, and that's why you're on this show to let everybody know, um, you know, this wonderful material that's available to all of us out there. So I would highly recommend checking that out. Um, some of your favorite songs that may not. Uh, you know, be on the on the top of everybody's list, but some of the songs that you have found throughout the years that, you know, this one wasn't a hit, but I really like it. What are some of those songs? What, by Jerry Lee Lewis or, or, or... By Jerry Lee, yes. By Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, yeah. Uh, High Heel Sneakers was a great one. It was on an album, uh, The Greatest Live Show on Earth. And, uh, and, and he never called it properly in the studio, uh, any various demos and outtakes. But in 1964, yeah, uh, the, the live version of that, that, that is fantastic. I mean, it was a standard. I, I mean, you know, the Rolling Stones did it and a, a few others. Tommy Tucker, yeah. Oh, Tommy Tucker, you're talking, I'm trying to think of his name. Yeah, 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 Tommy Tucker. But yeah, I love his version of High All Sneakers. Uh, it's, it's so difficult. It, it, there's so many. Uh, yeah, yeah there, are, there, are so, there are so many. How about some of the country? I mean, people forget about how, how many country hits that he had. Yeah, ab absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, from 68 to... Around about eighty-two, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I, I don't know without checking how many, but it was something like about forty country hits. You know, it, 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 and a lot of them, you know, big hits. You know, number ones, twos, threes. Yeah, yeah. I started working for MCA Records in nineteen eighty-one, and I remember when the album came out, uh, "My Fingers Do the My Fingers Do the Talking." Yeah, and they only reached number 62 on the charts. But uh, yeah, it was like, oh, my goodness, I forgot about. Well, I didn't really know a lot about Jerry Lee, except for the few hits that he had, because we were about the same age at the time. We were both yeah. pretty young guys. And, and when you research and look more into his life, you go, man, he was a pioneer. He really did, you know, kind of embody that rock and roll lifestyle. And and it, it was great to see a, a guy like him just just, you know, keep going. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That was his, uh, uh, the My Fingers Do The Talking album. That was his first uh, album, well, first recordings after he nearly died in hospital the year, year before. Right. Uh, so, so, yeah, it was an important album. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Um, you know, he, he made it, uh, he kept going. How about duets, though? He, he started doing a lot of duets and he had done a lot of duets. Who are some of the great uh, duets that he recorded with or, uh, you know, the other partners that he had? Well, uh, the the the, uh, the bigger duet album he had was in 1969 with Linda Gale Lewis together, and that is a fantastic album. It re it really is. I I love that album. I, I really do. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, but but before that, uh, I mean, he did some duets with Charlie Rich, and then later he did. Uh, well, in in the 80s, he he did with uh, an album with Johnny Cash and Carl Perkins uh, and Roy Orbison, the class of '55. And then later on, uh, in, in his later years, 2006 to 2010, he, he, he did a couple of albums, Last Man Standing and uh, Mean Old Man. And, and everyone was on it, everyone who was still alive. You know, you know Mick Jagger, you know, Keith Richards, uh, Little Richard, 
uh, Mel Haggard, Willie Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, the legends of, of country music and rock. Yeah, George Jones, yeah. yeah. George Jones, wow. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, or why do you think, Jerry Lee and Elvis um, didn't really get along very well? Because they were both on Sun. I'm not sure if that's strictly strictly true. Yeah, you know, there, there 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 was a competition between them, but uh, I, I think there was a, a friendship. I, I should think Elvis found uh, Jerry Lee a bit too much, but uh, I suspect he also uh, respected his honesty. Yeah, you know, sort of thing. But uh, I, I don't know if you ever seen the uh, the, the uh, con concert Jerry did in Toronto in 1969. The uh, it, it was it, it was a live piece in Toronto concert, and he, he did a. Uh, 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 about seven songs and it's, it's all on youtube but but anyway uh, about a week or so before that jerry Lee lewis and his long-term band member kenny lovelace they they was by special invitation they went to see elvis at the uh somewhere in las vegas i think the hilton or international something like that but but anyway uh and then when J uh, jerry Lee lewis did this concert he, he he obviously still had Elvis in his mind because he there was nearly all Elvis songs. He started it started with "Don't Be Cruel." He did "Mystery Train." He, he oh, did wow. uh, "Jailhouse Rock," you know, sort of thing. So, so eh, Jerry uh, loved Elvis, and, uh, and I, I think there was a lot of respect between them, really. So. Interesting, yeah. The the king of rock and roll. Uh, now, along with Jerry Lee Lewis, um, were you uh, contemplating writing maybe a, another book about perhaps other members of the Sun family? Not necessarily the Sun family. I, I did, uh, or I'm still considering uh, doing a similar one on Chuck Berry, but there's all there's already some good uh, Chuck Berry books out there, and uh, possibly L Little Richard. Uh, I'm a big fan of Little Richard, and uh, yeah, yeah I, I've, I've got everything he he, he he ever did, yeah, really, and tons of videos and that. So <laughs> maybe maybe Little Richard, yeah. Perhaps, in my opinion, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, uh, Peter, Little Richard might have been, in my opinion, the king of rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I think Paul McCartney would agree with that. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> big yeah. influence. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote, performed, and kind of um, he just really had the. Uh, there was just something about him. Uh, you know, he was he was a strange guy, but he really could entertain and do things at a level I haven't seen very often throughout uh, my lifetime. I first saw Little Richard in 1992. It was a, a tour called the Giants of Rock and Roll, and Jerry Lee Lewis was on the tour as well, and Lloyd Price, Bobby V, Little Eva. But, but it was in 1992 in London, and it was his 60th birthday. And I'd never seen, I'd never seen Little Richard before. And then he came, came out, and, uh, and there was this bigger introduction. And uh, before Little Richard he even uh, even started singing, they brought out a birthday cake, and Lloyd Price brought it out actually, and and that was nice. But but then I thought, you know, he had he had this entertaining. But then Little Richard launched into Lucille. I was crying. It was so good. There was tears running down down my face. It was like wow, wow. Lucille, wow. Yeah, fifty seven. It was on Specialty Records. Uh, man. Yeah, it, it hold. You know, that's the mark of a great rock and roll record or any record is that how could how could this stand up to today? Absolutely. Interestingly, you talk about the king of rock and roll. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis is a mother, always considered Chuck Berry the king of rock and roll. <laughs> Arguably, yes. I mean, Chuck uh, wrote a lot of his own music. He really kind of um, echoed the feelings of teenagers at the time. And he certainly had a, a heck of a lot of great songs that never get played on the radio. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, Jerry Lewis covered uh, Little Queenie. And, uh, and and the only reason he did that was uh, Jerry Lewis's mother had the Chuck Berry record and was playing it over and over again. And and she was saying, this is so great. This is so great. And, uh, and that drove Jerry mad. He said, right, I've got to go and prove that I can do this even better. And, and whether he did or not, you know, that, that's a mute point. And, they're both great versions, but that's that's the one reason Jerry Lee Lewis pulled out a single of Little Queenie right. just a few months after Chuck Berry's. So. Wow, yeah, that's uh, that's great. You know, Jerry is is one of those guys, and um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, I had the opportunity to speak with him. It took me an awful long time for him to finally get to the telephone to do it, but it was worth it. And uh, you could just hear it in his voice that he he loved what he he loved what he did, and. You know, he just doesn't, uh, he's one of those guys, I would say that, like the old man on the porch, you know, get off my lawn. But once you get to know him, 
he's got a heart of gold. I, I think that's a good way of summarizing him uh, in his later years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I found Dick Dale to be the same way. Oh, right. Yeah. Great surf yeah. guitarist. Yeah, he was mm. he was a wonderful man. But, you know, when he had an exterior and a facade that he felt that a lot of people in the music business uh, didn't treat him with the respect that I think that he felt that he was entitled to. And that was a problem. And I don't blame him. I mean, somebody, you know, people that have created such a great sound and a great persona are kind of often in America forgotten about or just pushed to the side like they, they don't matter anymore. Mm. And, and and people just, you know, cling to what's popular now. You and I can realize the greatness of these people, but, you know, that's why we're doing the interview to kind of uh, broaden people's horizons to have a further understanding of the great people of rock and roll. Absolutely, yeah. 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 If you had to, uh, I always ask this question, but I, I it gives me an insight of, uh, you know, where your mind is. Uh, the five greatest Jerry Lee records. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, Mean Woman Blues. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and another early one, Loving Up a Storm. It was a single. It, it didn't do much in America, but it, it was a minor hit in 1959 in the UK. That, that, that's a great record. I prefer that to Great Balls of Fire and Breathless, and that's one of his greatest rock and roll ones. Uh, High Old Sneakers, I've mentioned. Uh, there's a song on Soul My Way called It's a Hang Up Baby, and uh, he doesn't even play piano on it, but uh, that is fantastic. It shows what a great soul singer Jerry Lewis was, yeah. And uh, I've, I've, got, I've got to include one uh, country song. Uh, I suppose Once More With Feeling, uh, Chris Christopherson wrote it, and it was a big country hit for him. Yeah, Once More With Feeling. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic record as well. Indeed. Well, as always, Peter, um, what an honor to speak with you, and I hope to make it to London, uh, maybe within a year, um, to be able to meet you in person and possibly you and I could sit down and just, uh, you know, shoot the breeze about rock and roll and just share stories. Please do. I'd love to. Love to. All right. Uh, w one more time. Let's uh, let the audience know where they can get your books and how many. There's 12 out there now, and uh, maybe just run down a few titles for you that uh, people can uh, peruse or look up. Well, a few of the titles, yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis, Breathless. Uh, the, the one I spoke to you uh, last time about, Undercover, 500 Rolling Stones cover versions that you must hear. <laughs> those two, those la last two books are my two favourite, personal favourites. But uh, I did one on Shindig, that's a very, very successful one. Great, uh, great. Two on Top of the Pops, which is a very, very, very big UK show. Uh, uh, let's stomp the, uh, the the American rock and roll that made the British beat, something like that. I, I can't remember the exact title. I'm trying to look there, but they're always hidden behind junk in my office. <laughs> but, but, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at this right now. There, it's, I wouldn't call it junk. I would just say it, it's great. It's research material. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, they can get them all from Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the biggest bookshop in the world. Yeah. Amazon in any country, in the USA, UK, Australia, yeah, France, yeah, any, anywhere. Peter, before I let you go, can you do a promo for my radio show? Just give your name and, uh, you know, and say you're listening to the Ray Carr Show in Cleveland. Yeah, that's right. This is Peter Chexfield, writer from England. I'm listening to the Ray Carr Show, my very favorite radio show. Thank you, Peter. Um, I really, really, really appreciate it.